Chapter Thirty of the Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Vera rose the next morning pale and exhausted, but without any fever. She had wept out her malady on her grandmother's breast. The doctor professed himself satisfied and said she should stay in her room for a few days. Everything in the house went on as before. There were no festivities in honor of Vera's name day, as she had expressed a wish that there should be none. Neither Marfinka nor the Vikentievs came. A messenger was sent to Kolchina with the announcement that Vera Vasilyevna was unwell and was keeping her room. Tushin sent his congratulations in a respectful note, asking for a permission to come and see her. Her reply was that he should wait a little until she was better. Under the pretext of Vera's illness, callers who came from the town to present their congratulations were not admitted. Only the servants celebrated the occasion in their own way, the maids appeared in their gay dresses, and the coachman and the lackeys got drunk. Vera and her aunt developed a new relationship. Tatiana Markovna's consideration for Vera was by no means assumed, but her kindness did not make Vera's heart lighter. What she had expected and wished was severe judgment, a penance, perhaps exile for half a year or a year to Tatiana Markovna's distant estate, where she would gradually win back her peace of mind, or at any rate forget, if it was true, as Raisky said, that time extinguishes all impressions. I see, thought Vera, that grandmother suffers inexpressibly. Grief has changed her altogether. Her figure is bowed and her face more deeply furrowed. Perhaps she is only sparing me now because her heart has opened itself to pity. She cannot bear to punish me now that I am ill and repentant. Vera had lost her pride, her self-respect, and her dignity, and if once these flowers are taken out of the crown which adorns the head of man, his doom is at hand. She tried to pray and could not, for she had nothing to pray for, and could only bow her head in humility. Raisky came into much closer relation with his aunt and Vera. His naturalness and genuine affection the friendly intimacy of his conversation his straightforwardness his talkative humour and the gleaming play of his fancy were a distraction and a consolation to both of them he often drew a laugh from them but he tried in vain to distract them from the grief which hung like a cloud over them both and over the whole house he himself was sad when he saw that neither his esteem nor Tatiana Markovna's kindness could give back to poor Vera her courage, her pride, her confidence, and her strength of will. Tatiana Markovna spent the nights in the old house on the divan opposite Vera's bed and watched her sleep. But it nearly always happened that they were both observing one another, so that neither of them found refreshing sleep. On the morning after a sleepless night of this kind, Tatiana Markovna sent for Tit Nikonich. He came gladly, plainly delighted that the illness which threatened Vera Vasilyevna had blown over, and bringing with him a watermelon of extraordinary size and a pineapple for a present. But a glance at his old friend was enough to make him change color. Tatiana Markovna hastily put on her fur-trimmed cloak, threw a scarf over her head, and signed to him to follow her as she led the way into the garden. They sat for two hours on Vera's bench. Then she went back to the house with bowed head, while he drove home overcome with grief, ordered his servants to pack, sent for post-horses, and drove to his estate, to which he had not been for many years. Raisky, who had gone to see him, heard the news with astonishment. He questioned his aunt, who told him 
that some disturbance had broken out on Tit Nikonich's estate. Vera was sadder than ever. Lines began to appear on her forehead, which would one day become furrows. Sometimes she would approach the table on which the unopened blue letter lay, and then turn away. Where should she flee? Where conceal herself from the world? When nights fell, she lay down, put on the light, and stared wide-eyed in front of her. She wanted to forget to sleep, but sleep would not come. Dark spots, blacker than night, danced before her eyes. Shadows moved up and down with a wave-like motion in the glimmer of light that lay around the window. But she felt no fear. She would not have died of terror if there had risen suddenly out of the corner a ghost, a thief or a murderer. She would not have felt any fear if she had been told that her last hour was come. She looked out unceasingly into the darkness, at the waving shadows, at the flitting specks which stood out the more clearly in the blackness of the night, at the rings of changing color which whirled shimmering round her. Slowly and quietly the door opened. Vera propped herself on her elbow and saw a hand carrying a lamp carefully shaded. Tatiana Markovna dropped her cloak from her shoulder on a chair and approached the bed, looking not unlike a ghost in her white dressing gown. Vera had laid her head back on the pillow and pretended to sleep. Tatiana Markovna put the lamp on the table behind the bed head and sat down carefully and quietly on the divan, with her head leaning on her hand. She did not take her eyes from Vera, and when Vera opened her own an hour later, Tatiana Markovna was still looking fixedly at her. Can't you sleep, Vera? No. Why? Why do you punish me in the night too, grandmother? asked Vera in a low tone. The two women looked at one another, and both seemed to understand the speech in their eyes. "'You are killing me with sympathy, grandmother,' Vera went on. "'It would be better to drive me from your sight, but it is very hard for me to bear when you measure out your scorn drop by drop. Either forgive me, or, if that is impossible, bury me alive. Why are you silent?' What is on your mind? Your silence tortures me. It seems to say something, and yet never says it. It is so hard, Vera, to speak. Pray and understand your grandmother, even when she is silent. I have tried to pray, and cannot. What have I to pray for, except that I should die the sooner? I shall die, I know. Only let it come quickly, for, like this, it is impossible to live. It is possible, said Tatiana Markovna, drawing a deep sigh. After that? After that, replied her grandmother. You don't know, grandmother, said Vera with a hopeless sigh. You have not been a woman like me. Tatiana Markovna stooped down to Vera and whispered in a hardly audible voice, A woman like you? Vera looked at her in amazement, then let her head fall back on the pillow and said wearily, You were never in my position. You are a saint. A sinner, rejoined Tatiana Markovna. We are all sinners but not a sinner of that kind of that kind vera seized tatiana markovna's dress with both hands and pressed her face to hers the words that came from her troubled breast sounded like hisses why do you slander yourself is it in order to come and help me grandmother do not lie i never lie and you know it and how should I begin to do so now? I am a sinner, and myself need forgiveness, she said, throwing herself on her knees and bowing her grey head. Why do you say these things to me? said Vera, staring at the kneeling woman, 
and pressing her head to her breast take your words back again i have not heard them or will forget them will regard them as the product of a dream do not torture yourself for my sake rise grandmother tatiana markovna lay on her breast sobbing like a child why did you tell me this said vera it was god's wish that i should humble myself to ask you my child for forgiveness if you grant me your forgiveness vera i too can forgive you i had hoped to keep my secret until i died and now my sin has plunged you into ruin you rescue me grandmother from despair and myself vera god forgives but he demands cleansing i thought my sin was forgotten and forgiven because of my silence i seemed to men to be virtuous but my virtue was a lie god has punished my sin forgive me from your heart does one forgive one's mother you are a saint a mother without a peer in the whole wide world if i had known you as you really are how could i have acted contrary to your will that is my second terrible sin i was silent and did not tell you to beware of the precipice your dead mother will call me to account for my failure i know she comes to me in my dreams and is now here between us do you also forgive me departed one she cried wildly stretching out her arms in supplication vera shuddered forgive me vera i ask forgiveness of you both we will pray vera tried to raise her to her feet and tatiana markovna raised herself with difficulty and sat down on the divan vera bathed her temples with eau de cologne and gave her a sedative then she kneeled down before her and covered her hand with kisses what is hidden must be revealed began tatiana markovna when she had recovered a little for forty-five years only two human beings beside myself have known it he and vasilisa and i thought the secret would die with me and now it is made public my god she cried wildly stretching her folded arms to the picture of the christ had i known that this stroke would ever fall on another on my child i would have confessed my sin there and then to the all world in the cathedral square vera still hesitated to believe what she heard was it a heroic measure a generous invention to rescue and restore her own self-respect but her aunt's prayers her tears her appeal to vera's dead mother no actress would have dared to use such devices and her aunt was the soul of truth and honour warm life pulsed in vera's heart and her heart was lightened she felt as if life was streaming through her veins after an evil dream peace tapped at the door of her soul the dark forsaken temple which was now gaily lighted once more and the home of prayer she felt that tatiana markovna and she were inseparable sisters and she even began involuntarily to address her as thou as she had done raisky when her heart responded to his kindness as these thoughts whirled in her head she had a sensation of lightness and freedom like a prisoner whose fetters have been removed grandmother she said rising you have forgiven me and you love me more than you do any of the others more than marfinka that i realize but do you know and understand my love for you 
I should not have suffered as I did, but for my love for you. How long we have been strangers! I will tell you all, Vera, and you must hear my confession. Judge me severely, but pardon me, and God will pardon us both. I will not. I ought not. I may not, cried Vera. To what end should I hear it? so that I may suffer once more as I suffered five and forty years ago. You know my sin, and Boris shall know it. He may laugh at the grey hairs of old Kunigunde. As she strode up and down, shaking her head in her fanatical seriousness, with sorrow and triumphant dignity in her face, her resemblance to the old family portrait in the gallery was very marked. Beside her, Vera felt like a small and pitiful child as she gazed timidly into her aunt's eyes. She measured her own young strength by the strength of this old woman who had ripened and remained unbroken in the long struggle of life. "'My whole life can never repay what you have done for me, grandmother.' Let this be the end of your penance, and tell me no more. If you are determined that Boris shall know, I will whisper a word about your past to him. Since I have seen your anguish, why should you suffer a longer martyrdom? I will not listen. It is not my place to sit in judgment on you. Let me hold your grey hairs sacred. Tatiana Markovna sighed and embraced Vera as you will your will is like god's forgiveness to me and i am grateful to you for sparing my gray hairs now said vera let us go across to your house where we can both rest tatiana markovna almost carried her across to the new house laid her on her own bed and lay down beside her when vera had fallen peacefully asleep her aunt rose cautiously, and in the light of the lamp watched the marble beauty of her forehead, her closed eyes, all sculptured pure and delicate, as if by a master hand, and at the expression of deep peace that lay on her face. She made the sign of the cross over Vera as she slept, touched her forehead with her lips, and sank on her knees in prayer have mercy on her she breathed if thy anger is not yet appeased turn it from her and strike my grey head presently she lay down beside vera with her arm around her neck vera woke occasionally opened her eyes and closed them again she pressed closer and closer to tatiana markovna as if no harm could befall her within the circle of those faithful arms. End of chapter 30。chapter 31 of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov。translated by M. Bryant。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。As the days went by, Malinovka assumed its wonted calm. The quiet life, which had been brought to a pause by the catastrophe, flowed evenly on. The peaceful atmosphere was not undisturbed by anxiety. Autumn had laid her hand on men as well as on nature. The household was thoughtful, silent, and cold. Smiles, laughter, and joy had vanished like the falling leaves, and even though the worst crisis was past, it had left behind it an atmosphere of gloom. Tatiana Markovna ruled her little kingdom once more. Vera was busily engaged in the house, and devoted much care and taste to the choice of Marfinka's trousseau. She had determined not to avoid any task, however simple and trivial it might be, while she awaited the opportunity of some serious work that life might offer her. She recognized that, with most people, avoidance of the trivial and the hope of something extraordinary and unprecedented 
were dictated either by idleness and incompetence or by morbid self-love and vanity she was paler than before her eyes were less sparkling and she had lost some of her vivacity of gesture but these changes were put down by every one to her narrow escape from nervous fever in fulfilment of tatiana markovna's insistently expressed wish vera had spoken to raisky of their aunt's passion of which tit nikonich had been the object but she said nothing of the sin even this partial confidence explained to raisky the riddle how tatiana markovna who in his eyes was an old maid could find the strength not only to bear the brunt of vera's misfortune but to soothe her and to rescue her from moral collapse and despair he showed in his intercourse with her more clearly than before a deep and affectionate esteem and an unbounded devotion he now no longer contradicted her so that an end was put to the earlier semi-comic warfare he had waged against her even in his gestures there was a certain reserve she inspired him with the astonishment and admiration which are called forth by women of exceptional moral strength the servants too were different even though the cloud had passed there was no sound of quarrelling abuse or laughter vasilisa found herself in an exceptionally difficult position since now that her mistress was restored to health she was called on to fulfil her vow one morning jacob vanished from the yard he had taken money from the box where the cash was kept for buying the oil for the lamps kept burning in front of the icons which were in his charge and had bought the promised candle which he set up before the sacred picture in the village church at early mass as there was a small surplus he crossed himself piously then betook himself to the poorer quarter of the town where he spent his riches and then reeled home again on his unsteady legs displaying a slight redness on his nose and his cheeks tatiana markovna happened to meet him she immediately smelt the brandy and asked in surprise what he had been doing he replied that he had been to church bowed his head devoutly and folded his arms on his breast he explained to vasilisa that he had done his duty in fulfilling his vow she looked at him in perturbation for in her anxieties about her mistress and in the preparations for the wedding she had not thought of her own vow here was jacob who had fulfilled his and was going about with a pious jubilant air and reminding her of her promised pilgrimage to kiev i don't feel strong enough she complained i have hardly any bones in me only flesh lord have mercy on me for thirty years she had been steadily putting on flesh she lived on coffee tea bread potatoes and gherkins and often fish even at those times of the year when meat was permitted in her distress she went to father vassili to ask him to set her doubts at rest she had heard that kind priests were willing to release people from their vows or to allow substituted vows where weakness of body hindered the performance of the original as you agreed to go you must go said father vassili i agreed because i was frightened little father i thought that mistress would die but she was well again in three days why then should i make the long journey yes there is no short road to kiev if you had no inclination to go you should not have registered the vow the inclination is there but strength fails me i suffer from want of breath even when i go to church i am already in my seventh decade father it would be different if mistress had been three months in bed if she had received the sacraments and the last unction and then had been restored to health by god in answer to my prayer 
then i would have gone to kiev on my hands and knees well what is to be done asked father vassili smiling now i should like to promise something different i will lay a fast on myself never to eat another bit of meat until i die do you like meat i can't bear the sight of it and have weaned myself from eating it a difficult vow said father vassili with another smile must be replaced by something as difficult or more difficult but you have chosen the easiest isn't there anything that it would be hard for you to carry out think again vasilisa thought and said there was nothing very well then you must go to kiev i would gladly go if i were not so stout how can your vow be eased said father vasily thinking aloud what do you live on on tea coffee mushroom soup potatoes do you like coffee yes little father abstain from coffee that is nearly as bad she sighed as going to kiev what am i to live on on meat it seemed to her that he was laughing and indeed he did laugh when he saw her face you don't like it he said but make the sacrifice what good does it do me and to eat meat is not fasting father eat it on the days when it may be eaten the good it will do is that you will lay on less fat in six months you are absolved of your vow she went away in some distress and began to execute the priest's instructions the next day turning her nose sadly away from the steaming coffee that she brought her mistress in the morning in about ten days marfinka returned in company with her fiance and his mother Vikentiev and she brought their laughter, their gaiety, and their merry talk into the quiet house. But within a couple of hours after their arrival, they had become quiet and timid, for their gaiety had aroused a melancholy echo, as in an empty house. A mist lay on everything. Even the birds had ceased to fly to the spot where Marfinka fed them. Swallows, starlings, and all the feathered inhabitants of the park were gone and not a stork was to be seen flying over the volga the gardener had thrown away the withered flowers the space in front of the house usually radiant and sweet with flowers now showed black rings of newly dug earth framed in yellowish grass the branches of some of the trees had been enveloped in bast and the trees in the park became barer with every day. The Volga grew darker and darker, as if the river were preparing for its icy winter sleep. Nature does not create, but it does emphasize human melancholy. Marfinka asked herself what had happened to everybody in the house as she looked doubtfully round her. Even her own pretty little room did not look so gay. It was as if Vera's nervous silence had invaded it. Her eyes filled with tears. Why was everything so different? Why had Verochka come over from the other house? And why did she walk no more in the field or in the thicket? Where was Tit Nikonich? They all looked worried and hardly spoke to one another, they did not even tease Marfinka and her fiancé. Vera and grandmother were silent. What had happened to the whole house? It was the first trouble that Marfinka had encountered in her happy life, and she fell in unconsciously with the serious dull tone that obtained in Malinovka. Silence, reserve and melancholy were equally foreign to Vikentiev's nature. He urged his mother to persuade Tatiana Markovna to allow Marfinka to go back with them to Kolchina until the wedding at the end of October. To his surprise, permission was given easily and quickly, and the young people flew like swallows from autumn 
to the warmth, light, and brightness of their future home. Raisky drove over to fetch Tit Nikonich. He was haggard and yellow, and hardly stirred from his place, and he only gradually recovered, like a child whose toys have been restored to him, when he saw Tatiana Markovna in her usual surroundings, and found himself in the middle of the picture, either at table, with her serviette tucked in his collar, or in the window, on the stool near her chair, with a cup of tea before him poured out by her hands. Another member was added to the family circle at Malinovka, for Aisky brought Kozlov to dinner one day to receive the heartiest of welcomes. Tatiana Markovna had the tact not to let the poor forsaken man see that she was aware of his trouble. She greeted him with a jest. Why have you not been near us for so long, Leonti Ivanovich? Borushka says that I don't know how to entertain you, and that you don't like my table. Did you tell him so? How should I not like it? When did I say such a thing? he asked Raisky severely. You are joking, he went on as everybody laughed, and he himself had to smile. He had had time to find his own bearings, and had begun to realize the necessity of hiding his grief from others. Yes, it is a long time since I was here. My wife has gone to Moscow to visit her relations, so that I could not... You ought to have come straight to us, observed Tatiana Markovna, when it was so dull by yourself at home. I expect her, and am always afraid she may come when I am not at home. You would soon hear of her arrival, and she must pass our house. From the windows of the old house we can see who comes along the road, and we will stop her. It is true that the road to Moscow can be seen from here, said Kozlov, looking quickly and almost happily at his hostess. Come and stay with us, she said. I simply will not let you go today, said Raisky. I am bored by myself, and we will move over into the old house. After Marfinka's wedding, I am going away, and you will be the grandmother's and Vera's first minister, friend and protector. Thank you. If I am not in the way... How can you talk like that? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh, forgive me, Tatiana Markovna. Better eat your dinner. The soup is getting cold. I am hungry, too he said, suddenly seizing his spoon. He ate his soup silently, looking round him as if he were seeking the road to Moscow, and he preserved the same demeanour all through the meal. It is so quiet here, he said after dinner, as he looked out of the window. There is still some green left, and the air is so fresh. Listen, Boris Pavlovich, I should like to bring the library here. As you like. Tomorrow, as far as I am concerned, it is your possession to do as you please with. What should I do with it now? I will have it brought over so that I can take care of it, else in the end that man Mark will... Raisky strode about the room, Vera's eyes were fixed on her needlework, and Tatiana Markovna went to the window. Shortly after this, Raisky took Leonti to the old house, to show him the room that Tatiana Markovna had arranged for him. Leonti went from one window to another to see which of them commanded a view of the Moscow road. End of chapter 31《Chapter 32 of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov Translated by M. Bryant This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On a misty autumn day, as Vera sat at work in her room, Yakov brought her a letter written on blue paper, which had been brought by a lad who had instructions to wait for an answer. When she had recovered from the first shock at the sight of the letter, she took it, laid it on the table, and dismissed Yakov. She tried to go on with her work, but her hands fell helplessly on her lap. When will there be an end of this torture? she whispered nervously. 
Then she took from her bureau the earlier unopened blue letter, laid it by the side of the other, and covered her face with her hands. What answer could he expect from her, she asked herself, when they had parted forever? Surely he dare not call her once more? If so, an answer must be given, for the messenger was waiting. She opened the letters and read the earlier one. Are we really not to meet again, Vera? That would be incredible. A few days ago there would have been reason in our separation. Now it is a useless sacrifice, hard for both of us. We have striven obstinately with one another for a whole year for the prize of happiness, and now that the goal is attained you run away. Yet it is you who spoke of an eternal love. Is that logical? Logical, she repeated, but she collected her courage and read on. I am now permitted to choose another place of residence, but now I cannot leave you, for it will be dishonorable. You cannot think that I am proud of my victory and that it is easy for me to go away. I cannot allow you to harbor such an idea. I cannot leave you because you love me. Once more she interrupted her reading, but resumed it with an effort. And because my whole being is in a fever, let us be happy, Vera. Be convinced that our conflict, our quarreling, was nothing but the mask of passion. The mask has fallen, and we have no other ground of dispute. In reality, we have long been one. You ask for a love which shall be eternal. Many desire that but it is an impossibility. She stopped her reading to tell herself with a pitying smile that his conception of love was of a perpetual fever. My mistake was in openly asserting this truth, which life itself would have revealed in due course. From this time onwards I will not assail your convictions, for it is not they, but passion, which is the essential factor in our situation. Let us enjoy our happiness in silence. I hope that you will agree to this logical solution. Vera smiled bitterly as she continued to read. They would hardly allow you to go away with me, and indeed that is hardly possible. Nothing but a wild passion could lead you to do such a thing, and I do not expect it. Other convictions indifferent to me would be needed to impel you to this course. You would be faced with a future which fulfills neither your own wishes nor the demands of your relations, for mine is an uncertain existence without home, hearth, or possessions. But if you think you can persuade your grandmother, we will be betrothed, and I will remain here until for an indefinite time. A separation now would be like a bad comedy in which the unprofitable role is yours, at which Reisky, when he hears of it, will be the first to laugh. I warn you again now, as I did before. Send your reply to the address of my landlady, Sekletaya Burdalakov. In spite of her exhaustion after reading this epistle, Vera took up the one which Jacob had just brought. It was hastily written in pencil. Every day I have been wandering about by the precipice, hoping to see you in answer to my earlier letter. I have only just heard by chance of your indisposition. Come, Vera, if you are ill, write two words, and I will come myself to the old house. If I receive no answer today, I will expect you tomorrow at five o'clock in the arbor. I must know quickly whether I should go or stay, but I do not think we shall part. In any case, I expect either you or an answer. If you are ill, I will make my way into your house. Terrified by his threat of coming, she seized pen and paper, but her hands trembled too much to allow her to write. I cannot, she exclaimed. I have no strength. I am stifled. How shall I begin, and what can I write? 
i have forgotten how i used to write to him to speak to him she sent for jacob and told him to dismiss the messenger and to say that an answer would follow later she wondered as she walked slowly back to her room when she would find strength that day to write to him what she should say she could only repeat that she could not and would not and to-morrow she told herself he would wait for her in the arbor he would be wild with disappointment and if he repeats his signals with the rifle he will come into conflict with the servants and eventually with grandmother herself she tried to write but threw the pen aside then she thought she would go to him herself tell him all she had to say and then leave him as once before her hands sought in vain her mantilla her scarf and without knowing what she did she sank helplessly down on the divan if she told her grandmother the necessary steps would be taken but otherwise the letters would begin again or should she send her cousin who was after all her natural and nearest friend and protector to convince mark that there was no hope for him but she considered that he also was in the toils of passion and that it would be hard for him to execute the mission that he might be involved in a heated dispute which might develop into a dangerous situation she turned to tushin whom she could trust to accomplish the errand effectively without blundering but it seemed impossible to set tushin face to face with the rival who had robbed him of his desires yet she saw no alternative no delay was possible to-morrow would bring another letter and then failing an answer mark himself after brief consideration she wrote a note to tushin and this time the same pen covered easily and quickly the same paper that had been so impracticable half an hour before she asked him to come and see her the next morning until now vera had been accustomed to guard her own secrets and to exercise an undivided rule in the world of her thoughts if she had given her confidence to the priest's wife it was out of charity she had confided to her the calendar of her everyday life its events its emotions and impressions she had told her of her secret meetings with mark but concealed from her the catastrophe telling her simply that all was over between them as the priest's wife was ignorant of the denouement of the story at the foot of the precipice she put down vera's illness to grief at their parting vera loved marfinka as she loved natalia ivanovna not as a comrade but as a child in more peaceful times she would again confide the details of her life to natalia ivanovna as before but in a crisis she went to tatiana markovna sent for tushin or sought help from her cousin boris now she put the letters in her pocket found her aunt and sat down beside her what has happened vera you are upset not upset but worried i have received letters from there from there repeated tatiana markovna turning pale the first was written some time ago but i have only just opened it and the second was brought to me to-day she said laying them both on the table you want me to know what is in them read them grandmother tatiana markovna put on her glasses and tried to read them but she found that she could not decipher them and eventually vera had to read them she read in a whisper suppressing a phrase here and there then she crumpled them up and put them back in her pocket what do you think verochka asked tatiana markovna uncertainly he is willing to be betrothed and to remain here perhaps if he is prepared to live like other people if he loves you and if you think you could be happy he calls betrothal a comedy and yet suggests it he thinks that only that is needed to make me happy grandmother you know my frame of mind so why do you ask me you came to me to ask me what you should decide began tatiana markovna with some hesitation 
as she did not yet understand why Vera had read her the letters. She was incensed at Mark's audacity, and feared that Vera herself might be seized with a return of her passion. For these reasons she concealed her anxiety. It was not for that that I came to you, grandmother. You know that my mind has long been made up. I will have no more to do with him, and if I am to breathe freely again, and to hope to be able to live once more, it is under the condition that I hear nothing of him, that I can forget everything. He reminds me of what has happened, calls me down there, seeks to allure me with talk of happiness, will marry me. Gracious heaven! Understand, grandmother, she went on as Tatiana Markovna's anxiety could no longer be concealed, that if by a miracle he now became the man I hoped he would be, if he now were to believe all that I believe, and loved me as I desired to love him, even if all this happened, I would not turn aside from my path at his call. No song could have been sweeter to the ears of Tatiana Markovna. I should not be happy with him, Vera continued. I could never forget what he had been or believe in the new mark. I have endured more than enough to kill any passion. There is nothing left in my heart but a cold emptiness, and but for you, grandmother, I should despair. She wept convulsively, her head pressed against her aunt's shoulder. Do not recall your sufferings, Verochka, and do not distress yourself unnecessarily. We agreed never to speak of it again. But for the letters, I should not have spoken, for I need peace. Take me away, grandmother, hide me, or I shall die. He calls me to that place. Tatiana Markovna rose and drew Vera into the armchair, while she drew herself to her full height. If that is so, she said, if he thinks he can continue to annoy you, he will have to reckon with me. I will shield and protect you. Console yourself, child. You will hear no more of him. What will you do? She asked in amazement, springing from her chair. He summons you? Well, I will go to the rendezvous in your place, and we will see if he calls you any more, or comes here, or writes to you. She strode up and down the room, trembling with anger. At what time does he go to the arbor tomorrow? At five, I think? She asked sharply. Grandmother, you don't understand, said Vera gently, taking her hand. Calm yourself. I make no accusation against him. Never forget that I alone am guilty. He does not know what has happened to me during these days, and therefore he writes. Now it is necessary to explain to him how ill and spiritless I am, and you want to fight. I don't wish that. I would have written to him, but could not, and I have not the strength to see him. I would have asked Ivan Ivanovitch, but you know how he cares for me, and what hopes he cherishes, to bring him into contact with a man who has destroyed those hopes is impossible. Impossible, agreed Tatiana Markovna. God knows what might happen between them. You have a near relation who knows all and loves you like a sister, Borushka. If that were how he loved me, thought Vera. She did not mean to reveal Raisky's passion for her, which remained her secret. Perhaps I will ask my cousin, she said, or I will collect my strength and answer the letter myself so as to make him understand my position and renounce all hope. But in the meantime, I must let him know so that he does not come to the arbor to wait in vain for me. I will do that, struck in Tatiana Markovna. But you will not go yourself, asked Vera, looking direct into her eyes. Remember that I make no complaint against him and wish him no evil. Nor do I 
returned her aunt, looking away. You may be assured I will not go myself, but I will arrange it so that he does not await you in the arbor. Forgive me, grandmother, for this fresh disturbance. Tatiana Markovna sighed and kissed her niece. Vera left the room in a calmer frame of mind, wondering what means her aunt proposed to take to prevent Mark from coming next day to the arbor. Next day at noon, Vera heard horses' hoofs at the gate. When she looked out of the window, her eyes shone with pleasure for a moment as she saw Tushin ride into the courtyard. She went to meet him. I saw you from the window, she said, adding, as she looked at him, Are you well? What else should I be? He answered with embarrassment, turning his head away so that she should not notice the signs of suffering on his face. And you? I fell ill, and my illness might have taken an ill turn, but now it is over. Where is grandmother? she asked, turning to Vasilisa. The mistress went out after tea and took Savelli with her. Vera invited Tushin to her room, but for the moment both were embarrassed. Have you forgiven me? asked Vera after a pause without looking at him. Forgiven you? For all you have endured. Ivan Ivanovich, you have changed. I can see that you carry a heavy heart. Your suffering and grandmother's is a hard penance for me. But for you three, grandmother, you and cousin Boris, I could not survive. And yet you say that you give us pain. Look at me. I think I am better already. If you would only recover your own peace of mind, it will all be over and forgotten. I had begun to recover and to forget. Marfinka's marriage is close at hand. There was a great deal to do, and my attention was distracted. But yesterday I was violently excited, and am not quite calm now. What has happened? Can I serve you, Vera Vasilievna? I cannot accept your service. Because you do not think me able... Not that. You know all that has happened. Read what I have received. She said, taking the letters from a box and handing them to him. Tushin read and turned as pale as he had been when he arrived. You are right. In this matter my assistance is superfluous. You alone can... I cannot, Ivan Ivanovich, she said while he looked at her interrogatively. I can neither write a word to him nor see him, yet I must give him an answer. He will wait there in the arbor, or if I leave him without an answer, he will come here and I can do nothing. What kind of answer? You ask me the same question as grandmother. Yet you have read the letter. He promises me happiness, will submit to a betrothal. Yesterday I tried to write to him to tell him that I was not happy, and should not be happy after betrothal, and to bid him farewell. But I cannot put these lines on paper, and I cannot commission any one to deliver my answer. Grandmother flared up when she read the letter, and I fear she would not be able to restrain her feelings, so I... You thought of me, said Tushin, standing up. Tushin, you thought, would do you this service, and then you sent for me. Pride, joy, and affection shone in his eyes. No, Ivan Ivanovich, I sent for you so that you might be at my side in these difficult hours. I am calmer when you are here. But I will not send you. Down there I will not inflict on you this last insult, will not set you face to face with a man who cannot be an object of indifference to you. No, no. Tushin was about to speak, but instead he stretched out his hands in silence, and Vera looked at him with mixed feelings of gratitude and sorrow, as she realized with what small things he was made happy. Insult, he said. It would have been hard to bear if you were to send me to him with an olive branch, to bring him up here from the depths of the precipice. But even though 
that dove-like errand would not suit me i would still undertake it to give you peace if i thought it would make you happy ivan ivanovitch replied vera hardly restraining her tears i believe you would have done it but i would never send you but now i am not asked to go outside my role of bear to tell him what you cannot write to him vera vasilievna would give me happiness she reflected that this was all the happiness with which she had to reward him and dropped her eyes his mood changed when he noticed her thoughtful melancholy air his proud bearing the gleam in his eyes and the color in his face disappeared he regretted his incautious display of pleasure it seemed to him that his delight and his mention of the word happiness had been tantamount to a renewal of his profession of love and the offer of his hand and had betrayed to her the fact that he rejoiced selfishly at her breach with mark vera guessed that he was deceiving himself once more her heart her feminine instinct her friendship these things prevented tushin from abandoning his hope she gave what she could an unconditional trust and a boundless esteem yes ivan ivanovitch i see now that i have placed my hopes on you though i did not confess it to myself and no one would have persuaded me to ask the service of you but since you make the generous offer yourself i am delighted and thank you with all my heart no one can help me as you do because no one else loves me as you do you spoil me vera vasilievna when you talk like that but it is true you read my very soul will it not be hard for you to see him no i shan't faint he smiled go at five o'clock to the arbor and tell him she considered a moment then scribbled with a pencil what she had said she wished to say without adding a word here is my answer she said handing him the open envelope you may add anything you think necessary for you know all and don't forget ivan ivanovitch that i blame him for nothing and consequently she added looking away you may leave your whip behind very well he said between his teeth forgive me said vera offering her hand i do not say it as a reproach i breathe more freely now that i have told you what i wish and what i don't wish in your interview and you thought i needed the hint pardon a sick woman she said and he pressed her hand again end of chapter thirty two Chapter thirty three of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov. Translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A little later, Tatiana Markovna and Raisky returned to the house. Raisky and Tushin were embarrassed in one another's presence and found it difficult to talk naturally about the simplest things. But at the dinner table, the real sympathy between them conquered the awkwardness of the situation they looked one another straight in the eyes and read there a mutual confidence after dinner raisky went to his room and tushin excused himself on the ground of business vera's thoughts followed him it was nearly five o'clock when he was trying to find his direction in the thicket although he was no stranger there he seemed not to be able to find what he sought he looked from side to side where the bushes grew more thickly certain that he must be in the neighborhood of the arbor he stood still and looked impatiently at his watch it was nearly five o'clock and neither the arbor nor mark were visible suddenly he heard a rustle in the distance and among the young pines a figure appeared and disappeared alternately mark was approaching and reached the place where tushin was standing they looked at one another a full minute when they met where is the arbor said mark at last 
i don't exactly know in which direction in which direction we are standing on the spot where it was still standing yesterday morning the arbor had vanished to allow of the literal carrying out of tatiana markovna's promise that mark should not wait for vera in the arbor an hour after her conversation with vera she had descended the precipice accompanied by savelli and five peasants with axes and within two hours the arbor had been carried away the peasant women and children helping to remove beams and boards next day the site of the arbor was levelled covered with turf and planted with young fir trees if i had had the arbor removed before thought tatiana markovna regretfully the rascal would have noticed it and would not have written her the letters the situation was clear enough to the rascal now that is the old lady's handiwork he thought when he saw the young fir trees her vera like a well-bred young woman has told her the whole story he nodded to tushin and was turning away when he saw his rival's eyes were fixed on him are you out for a stroll said mark why do you look at me in that extraordinary fashion i suppose you are visiting at malinovka tushin replied dryly and politely that he was a visitor at the house and had come down especially to see mark to see me asked mark quickly with a look of inquiry has he heard too he wondered he remembered that tushin admired vera and wondered whether the forest otello was meditating tragedy and murder on the green i have a commission for you said tushin handing him the letter without betraying any sense of discomfort or any sign of pain or rage mark read it rapidly do you know the whole story he asked allow me to leave that question unanswered and instead to ask you whether you have any answer to give said tushin mark shook his head i take it for granted that in accordance with her wish you will leave her in peace in the future that you will not remind her of your existence in any way will not write to her nor visit this place what business is it of yours asked mark are you her declared lover that you make these demands one does not need to be her fiance to execute a commission it is sufficient to be a friend and if i do write or do come here what then cried mark angrily i cannot say how vera vasilevna would take it but if she gives me another commission i will undertake it said tushin you are an obedient friend observed mark maliciously yes i am her friend replied tushin seriously i thought her wish would be law to you too she is just beginning to recover from a serious illness what is the matter with her said mark gently for him as he received no answer he went on excuse my outburst but you see my agitation calmness is desirable for you too is there any answer to this letter i do not need your assistance for that i will write she will not receive your letter her state of health necessitates quiet which she cannot have if you force yourself on her i tell you what was told me and what i have seen for myself do you wish her well asked mark i do you see that she loves me she has told you so she has not said so to me indeed she never spoke of love she gave me the letter i handed you and asked me to make it clear that she did not wish and was not indeed in a condition to see you or to receive any letter from you how ridiculous to make herself and other people suffer if you are her friend you can relieve her of her misery her illness and her collapse of strength the old lady has broken down the arbor but she has not destroyed passion and passion will break vera you say yourself she is ill i did not say that passion was the cause of her illness what can have made her ill asked mark 
your letters. You expect her in the arbor, and threaten to come to her yourself. That she cannot endure, and has asked me to tell you so. She says that, but in reality, she always speaks the truth. Why did she give you the commission? Receiving no answer, Mark continued, You have her confidence, and can therefore tell her how strange it is to refuse happiness. Advise her to put an end to the wretched situation, to renounce her grandmother's morality, and then I propose, if you understood Vera Vasilyevna, you would know that hers is one of those natures that declines explanations and advice. You execute your errands most brilliantly and diplomatically, said Mark angrily. Tushin looked at him without replying, and his calm silence enraged Mark. He saw in the disappearance of the arbor and the appearance on the scene of Tushin as a mediator the certain end of his hopes. Vera's hesitation was over, and she was now firmly determined on separation. He was enraged by his consciousness that Vera's illness was really not the result of her infatuation for him, which she would not have confessed to her aunt, much less to Tushin. Mark knew her obstinacy, which resisted even the flame of passion, and on that very account he had, almost in despair, resigned himself to submit to a formal betrothal, and had communicated his decision to her, had consented to remain in the town indefinitely, that is, so long as the tie between them held. Convinced of the truth of his conception of love, he foresaw that in the course of time passion would grow cool and disappear, that they would not forever be held by it, and then, then he was convinced Vera would herself recognize the situation and acquiesce in the consequences. And now his offer had become superfluous. No one was prepared to accept it, and he was simply to be dismissed. I do not know what to do, he said proudly. I cannot find any answer to your diplomatic mission. Naturally, I shall not again visit the arbor, as it has ceased to exist. And you will write no more letters either, added Tushin, as they would not in any case reach her. Neither will you come to the house, where you would not be admitted. Are you her guardian? That would depend on Vera Vasilyevna's wishes. There is a mistress of the house who commands her servants. I take it that you accept the facts. The devil knows, cried Mark, how ridiculous all this is. Mankind have forged chains for themselves and make martyrs of themselves. Although he still justified himself in making no reply, he felt that his position was untenable. I am leaving the place shortly, he said, in about a week's time. Can I not see Vera Vasilyevna for a minute? That cannot be arranged, because she is ill. Is any pressure being put upon her? She requires only one medicine, not to be reminded of you. I do not place entire confidence in you, because you do not appear to me to be an indifferent party. Tushin did not answer in the same tone. He understood Mark's feeling of bitter disillusion, and made another attempt at conciliation. If you do not trust me, he said, you hold the evidence in your hand. A dismissal, yes, but that proves nothing. Passion is a sea where storm reigns today and tomorrow dead calm. Perhaps she already repents having sent this. I think not. She takes counsel with herself before acting. It is plain from your last words that you don't understand Vera Vasilyevna. You will, of course, act in accordance with her wishes. I will not insist any more on an answer. There is no answer to give. I am going away. That is an answer. It is not she who needs an answer, but you, the romantic Raisky, and the old lady. Why not include the whole town? But I will take on myself to assure Vera Vasilyevna that your answer will be literally carried out. Farewell. Farewell, Sir Knight. Tushin frowned slightly, touched his cap, 
and was gone. Mark's face was very pale. He recognized bitterly that he was beaten, that his romance ended here at the foot of the precipice, which he must leave without once turning round, with no pity, no word of farewell to speed him. He was bidden to go as if he were a contemptible enemy. Why had all this come about? He was not conscious of any fault. Why should he part from her like this? She could not pretend that he had been the cause of what old-fashioned people would call her fall. He had gone so far as to belie his own convictions, to neglect his mission, and was even prepared to contemplate marriage. Yet he received a laconic note instead of a friendly letter, a go-between instead of herself. It was as if he had been struck with a knife, and a cold shiver ran through his body. It was not the old lady who had invented these measures, for Vera did not allow others to dictate to her. It must have been she, herself. What had he done, and why should she act with such severity? He went slowly away. When he reached the fence, he swung himself on to the top and sat there, asking himself again where his fault lay. He remembered that at their last meeting he had fairly warned her. He had said, in effect, Remember that I have warned you. If you stretch out your hand to me, you are mine, and the responsibility for the consequences rests with you. I am innocent. That was surely logical, he thought. Suddenly he sprang down on the road and went without looking back. He remembered how, at this very spot, he had prepared to leave her, but he heard her nervous, despairing cry of farewell, and had then looked round and rushed to her. As he answered these questions, his blood hammered in his veins. He strode up the hill. The knife had done its work. It bored deeper and deeper. Memory pitilessly revived a series of fleeting pictures. The inner voice told him that he had not acted honorably, and spared her when her strength had failed. She used to call you a wolf in jest, but the name will be no jest in her memory, for you joined to the fierceness of a wolf a fox's cunning, and the malice of a yapping dog. There was nothing human about you. She took with her from the depths of the precipice nothing but a bitter memory and a lifelong sorrow. How could she be so blind as to be led astray, to let herself be dazzled, to forget herself? You may triumph, for she will never forget you. He understood now the laconic note, her illness, and the appearance of Tushin instead of herself at the foot of the precipice. Leonti told Raisky that Mark had informed him that he was going to spend some time with his old aunt in the government of Novgorod. He intended to enter the army once more as an ensign, in the hope of being sent to Caucasus. End of chapter 33— Chapter 34 of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Raisky and Tushin had been talking all the evening, and for the first time in their lives observed one another closely, with the result that both felt a desire for a closer acquaintance. Tushin asked Raisky to be his guest for a week to have a look at the forest, the steam saw, and the timber industry. Raisky accepted, and the next day they crossed the river together in Tushin's boat. Vera's name did not cross their lips. Each was conscious that the other knew his secret. Raisky, in any case, had learned of Tushin's offer, of his behavior on that occasion, and of his part in the whole drama from Vera herself. 
his jealous prejudices had instantly vanished and he felt nothing but esteem and sympathy for tushin as he studied the personality of vera's friend as his fancy did him its usual service of putting the object not in itself a romantic one in the best light he admired tushin's simplicity and frankness after a week spent at smoke after seeing him at home in the factory in field and forest after talking through the night with him by the flickering light of the fire he understood how vera's eye and heart should have recognized the simple completeness of the man and placed tushin side by side with tatiana markovna and her sister in her affections raisky himself was attracted to this simple gentle and yet strong personality and would like to have stayed longer at smoke but tatiana markovna wrote asking him to return without delay as his presence was necessary at malinovka tushin offered to drive with him for company's sake as he said in reality he wanted to know why tatiana markovna had sent for raisky whether there was a new turn in vera's affairs or any service to be rendered her he remembered uncomfortably his meeting with mark and how unwillingly he had said that he was going away tushin wondered anxiously whether he had kept his promise whether he was annoying vera in any way when raisky reached malinovka he hurried straight to vera while his impressions were still fresh he drew in vivid colors a full-length portrait of tushin describing his surroundings and his activities with sympathetic appreciation vera sighed perhaps for sorrow that she did not love tushin more and differently raisky would have gone on talking about his visit if he had not had a message from his aunt that she would like to see him immediately he asked vera if she knew why he had been sent for i know something is wrong but she has not told me and i don't like to ask indeed i fear she broke off and at that moment tushin sent in word to know if she would receive him she assented when raisky entered her room tatiana markovna dismissed pashutka and locked the door she looked worried and old and her appearance terrified raisky has something disagreeable happened he asked sitting down opposite her what is done is done she said sadly i'm sitting on needles grandmother tell me quickly that old thief tichkov has had his revenge on us both he wormed out a tale about me from a crazy old woman but this has had no special results for people are indifferent to the past and in any case i stand with one foot in the grave and don't care about myself but vera what about vera grandmother her secret has ceased to be a secret rumors are going about the town at first i did not understand why on sunday at church the vice-governor's wife asked me twice about vera's health and why two other ladies listened curiously for my answers i looked round and read on every face the same question what was the matter with vera i said she had been ill but was better again then there were further questions and i extricated myself with difficulty the real misfortune thank god is concealed i learned from tit nikonich yesterday that the gossip is on the wrong track ivan ivanovich is suspected do you remember that on marfinka's birthday he said not a word but sat there like a mute until vera came in when he suddenly woke up the guests of course noticed it in any case it has long been no secret that he loves vera and he has no arts of concealment people said that they vanished into the garden that vera went later to the old house and tushin drove away do you know what he came for raisky nodded vera and tushin are coupled together in everybody's mouth you said that tichkov had dragged me in too polina karpovna did that 
she went out to find you in the evening when you were out late with vera you said something to her apparently in jest which she understood in her own way and she has involved you they say she had alienated you from vera with whom you were supposed to be in love and she keeps on repeating that she dragged you from the precipice what had you to do with her and what is the tale about vera perhaps you had been in her confidence for a long time and you both kept silence with me this is what your freedom has brought you to she sighed that silly old bird got off too easily said raisky clenching his fists tomorrow i will have it out with her you have found someone whom you could call to account what is the use of reproaching her she is ridiculous and no one cares what she says but the old chatterbox tichkov has established that on marfinka's birthday vera and tushin had a long conversation in the avenue that the day before she stayed out far into the night and was subsequently ill and he has put his own construction on polina karpovna's tale he is trumpeting it in the town that it was not with you but with tushin that she was walking about at night then to crown all a drunken old woman made revelations about me tichkov has extracted everything tatiana's eyes dropped and her face flushed for a moment that is another story said raisky seriously striding up and down the room the lesson you gave him was not sufficient i will try a repetition of it what do you mean god forbid that you should you will try to prove that the tale is not true which is not difficult it is only necessary to know where ivan ivanovitch spent the evening before marfinka's birthday supposing he was in his forest then people will ask who was with vera in the park the kritsky woman saw you at the top of the precipice and vera was what is to be done asked raisky in fear for vera god's judgments are put in the mouths of men whispered tatiana markovna sadly and they must not be despised we must humble ourselves and our cup is apparently not yet full conscious of the difficulties of their position both were silent vera's retired way of life tushin's devotion to her her independence of her aunt's authority were familiar and accustomed facts but raisky's attention to her wrapped this simple situation in an uncertainty which polina karpovna had noticed and had naturally not kept to herself it was not only tatiana markovna who had marked out tushin as vera's probable husband the town expected two great events marfinka's marriage with vikentiev which was about to take place and in no distant future tushin's marriage with vera then suddenly there were these incomprehensible unexpected happenings on her sister's birthday vera appeared among the guests only for a moment hardly spoke to any one then vanished into the garden with tushin and afterwards to the old house while tushin left without even saying good-bye to his hostess polina markovna had related how raisky on the eve of the family festival had gone out for a walk with vera following on this vera had fallen ill then tatiana markovna no one was admitted to the house raisky wandered about like one possessed and the doctors gave no definite report there was no word or sign of a wedding why had tushin not made his offer and if he made it why was it not accepted people surmised that raisky had entrapped vera if so why did he not marry her they were determined to know who was wrong and who was right and to give judgment accordingly both tatiana markovna and raisky were conscious of all this and feared the verdict for vera's sake grandmother said raisky at last you must tell ivan ivanovitch this yourself and be guided by what he says 
i know his character now and am confident that he will decide on the right course he loves vera and cares more for what happens to her than to himself he came over the volga with me because your letter to me made him anxious about vera when you have talked this over with him i will go to polina karpovna and perhaps see tichkov as well i am determined you shall not meet tichkov i must replied raisky i will not have it boris no good can come of it i will follow your advice and speak to ivan ivanovitch then we will see whether you need go to polina karpovna ask ivan ivanovitch to come here but say not a word to vera she has heard nothing so far and god grant that she never will raisky went to vera and his place with tatiana markovna was taken by tushin tatiana markovna could not disguise her agitation when ivan ivanovitch entered her room he made his bow in silence how did you find vera she asked after a pause she seemed to be well and calm god grant that she is but how much trouble all this has caused you she added in a low voice trying to avoid his eyes what does it matter if vera vasilievna has peace she was beginning to recover and i too felt happier so long as our distress was concealed tushin started as if he had been shot ivan ivanovitch continued tatiana markovna there is all sorts of gossip in the town porushka and i in a moment of anger tore the mask from that hypocrite tichkov you have no doubt heard the story such an outburst ill-fitted my years but he had been blowing his own trumpet so abominably that it was unendurable now he in his turn is tearing the mask from us from you i don't understand when he gossiped about me no one took any heed for i am already counted with my fathers but with vera it is different and they have dragged your name into the affair mine with vera vasilievna's please tell me what the talk is when tatiana markovna had told the story he asked what she wished him to do you must clear yourself she said you have been beyond reproach all your life and must be again as soon as marfinka's wedding is over i shall settle on my estate at novoselovo for good you should make haste to inform tichkov that you were not in the town on the day before marfinka's fete day and consequently could not have been at the precipice it ought to be done differently do just as you like ivan ivanovitch but what else can you say i would rather not meet tichkov he may have heard through others that i certainly was in the town i was spending a couple of days with a friend i shall spread it about that i did visit the precipice on that evening with vera vasilievna although that is not the case i might add that i had offered her my hand and had met with a refusal by which you tatiana markovna who gave me your approval were aggrieved that vera vasilievna felt bitterly the breach of our friendship one might even speak of a distant hope of a promise people will not be kept quiet by that for a promise cannot always remain a promise it will be forgotten tatiana markovna especially if you as you say leave the neighbourhood if it is not forgotten and you and vera vasilievna are further disturbed it is still possible he added in a low tone to accept my proposal ivan ivanovitch said tatiana markovna reproachfully do you think vera and i are capable of such a thing are we to avail ourselves of your past affection and your generosity merely to steal malicious gossip to stifle talk for which there is a basis of truth neither you nor vera would find happiness in that way there is no question of generosity tatiana markovna 
if a forest stands in one's way it must be hewn down bold men see no barrier in the sea and hew their way through the rock itself here there is no obstacle of forest sea or rock i am bridging the precipice and my feet will not tremble when i cross the bridge give me vera vasilievna no devil should disturb my happiness or her peace of mind if she lived to be a hundred she will be my tsaritsa and in the peace that reigns in my forest will forget all that now oppresses her you don't yet understand me i do whispered tatiana markovna tearfully but the decision does not lie with me he passed his hands across his eyes and through his thick hair then seized her hands forgive me i forgot the important point it is not mountain forest or sea but an insurmountable obstacle that confronts me vera vasilievna is not willing she looks forward to a happier future than i can offer her you sent for me to let me know of the gossip there is going about in the view that it must be painful didn't you do not let it disturb either yourself or vera vasilievna but take her away so that no word of it penetrates to her ears in the meantime i will spread in the town the account we have discussed that man he could not bring mark's name over his lips leaves the town to-morrow or the day after and all will be forgotten as for me since it is decided that vera vasilievna is not to be my wife it does not matter whether i die or live tatiana markovna pale and trembling interrupted him she will be your wife she said when she has learnt to forget i understand for the first time how you love vera do not lure me on with false hopes for i am not a boy who can give me security that vera vasilievna will ever i give you that security his eyes shone with gratitude as he took her hand tatiana markovna felt that she had gone too far and had promised more than she could perform she withdrew her hand and said soothingly she is still very unhappy and would not understand at present first of all she must be left alone i will wait and hope he said in a low tone if only i might like vikentiev call you grandmother she signed to him to leave her when he had gone she dropped on to her chair and covered her face with her handkerchief end of chapter thirty four Chapter thirty five of The Precipice by Ivan Goncharov, translated by M. Bryant. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Raisky had written to Polina Karpovna asking her if he might call the next day about one o'clock. Her answer was Charme, j'attends, and so on. He found her in her boudoir, in a stifling atmosphere of burning incense, with curtains drawn to produce a mysterious twilight she wore a white muslin frock with wide lace sleeves with a yellow dahlia at her breast near the divan was placed a sumptuously spread table with covers for two raisky explained that he had come to make a farewell call a farewell call i won't hear of such a thing you are joking it is a bad joke no no smile and take back the hated word she protested slipping her arm in his and leading him to the table don't think of going away vive l'amour et la joie she invited him with a coquettish gesture to be seated and hung a table napkin over his coat as she might to a child he devoted an excellent morning appetite to the food before him she poured out champagne for him and watched him with tender admiration after a longish pause 
when she had filled his glass for the third or fourth time she said well what have you to say about it then as raisky looked at her in amazement she continued i see i see take off the mask and have done with concealment ah sighed raisky putting his lips to his glass they drank to one another's health do you remember that night she murmured the night of love as you called it how should it fade from my memory he whispered darkly that night was the decisive hour i knew it a mere girl could not hold you une nullité cette pauvre petite fille qui n'a que sa figure shy inexperienced devoid of elegance she could not i have torn myself free and have found what you have long been seeking have you not what happened in the park to excite you so after a little fencing raisky proceeded with his story when i thought my happiness was within my grasp i heard tushin was there whispered polina karpovna holding her breath he nodded silently and raised his glass once more did too she said with a malicious smile she was walking alone lost in thought he said in a confidential tone while polina karpovna played with her watch chain and listened with strained attention i was at her heels determined to have an answer from her she took one or two steps down the face of the precipice when someone suddenly came towards her he he what did he do good evening vera vasilievna he said how do you do she shuddered hypocrisy not at all i hid myself and listened what are you doing here she said i'm spending two days in town he said to be present at your sister's feet and i have chosen that day decide vera vasilievna whether i am to love or not où les sentiments vont-ils se nicher exclaimed polina karpovna even in that clod ivan ivanovitch pleaded vera continued raisky he interrupted her with vera vasilievna decide whether to-morrow i should ask tatiana markovna for your hand or throw myself into the volga those were his words his very words mais il est ridicule what did she do she moaned cried yes and no she answered no ivan ivanovitch give me time to consider whether i can respond with the same deep affection that you feel for me give me six months a year and then i will answer yes or no your room is so hot polina karpovna could we have a little air raisky thought he had invented enough and glanced up at his hostess who wore an expression of disappointment c'est tout she asked oui he said in any case tushin did not abandon hope on the next day marfinka's birthday he appeared again to hear her last word from the precipice he went through the park and she accompanied him it seems that next day his hopes revived mine are forever gone and that is all people have been spreading god knows what tales about your cousin and you they have not even spared that saint tatiana markovna with their poisonous tongues that unendurable tchkov raisky pricked up his ears they talk about grandmother he asked waveringly he remembered the hint vera had given him of tatiana markovna's love story and he had heard something from vasilisa but what woman has not her romance they must have dug up some lie or some gossip out of the dust of forty years he must know what it was in order to stop tichkov's mouth what do they say about grandmother he asked in a low intimate voice ah c'est dégoûtant no one believes it and everybody is jeering at tichkov for having debased himself to interrogate a drink-maddened old beggar-woman i will not repeat it if you please he whispered tenderly you wish to know she whispered bending towards him 
then you shall hear everything this woman who stands regularly in the porch of the church of the ascension has been saying that tit nikonitch loved tatiana markovna and she him i know that he interrupted impatiently that is no crime and she was sought in marriage by the late count sergey ivanovitch i have heard that too she did not agree and the count married somebody else but she was forbidden to marry tit nikonitch i have been told all that by vasilisa what did the drunken woman say the count is said to have surprised a rendezvous between tatiana markovna and tit nikonitch and such a rendezvous <laughs> no no she cried shaking with laughter tatiana markovna who would believe such a thing raisky listened seriously and surmises flitted across his mind the count gave tit nikonitch a box on the ears that is a lie cried raisky jumping up tit nikonitch would not have endured it a lie naturally he did not endure it he seized a garden knife that he found among the flowers struck the count to the ground seized him by the throat and would have killed him raisky's face changed well he urged tatiana markovna restrained his hand you ah she said a nobleman not a bandit your weapon is a sword she succeeded in separating them and a duel was not possible for it would have compromised her the opponents gave their word the count to keep silence over what had happened and tit nikonitch not to marry tatiana markovna that is why she remains unmarried is it not a shame to spread such calumnies Raisky could no longer contain his agitation, but he said, You see, it is a lie. Who could possibly have seen and heard what passed? The gardener, who was asleep in a corner, is said to have witnessed the whole scene. He was a serf, and fear ensured his silence, but he told his wife, the drunken widow who is now chattering about it. Of course it is nonsense, incredible nonsense. I'm the first to cry that it is a lie, a lie. Our respected and saintly Tatiana Markovna. Polina Karpovna burst out laughing, but checked herself when she looked at Raisky. What is the matter? Allons donc, oublie tout, vive la joie. Do not frown. We will send for more wine, she said, looking at him with her ridiculous languishing air no no i'm afraid he broke off fearing to betray himself and concluded lamely it would not agree with me i'm not accustomed to wine he rose from his seat and his hostess followed his example good-bye forever he said no no she cried i must escape from these dangerous places from your precipices and abysses farewell farewell he picked up his hat and hurried away. Polina Karpovna stood as if turned to stone, then rang the bell and called for her carriage and for her maid to dress her, saying she had calls to pay. Raisky perceived that there was truth in the drunken woman's story, and that he held in his hand the key to his aunt's past. He realized now how she had grown to be the woman she was, and where she had won her strength, her practical wisdom, her knowledge of life and of men's hearts. He understood why she had won Vera's confidence, and had been able to calm her niece in spite of her own distress. Perhaps Vera, too, knew the story. While he had been manoeuvring to give another turn to the gossip about Vera's relations to himself and Tushin, he had lighted by chance on a forgotten but vivid page of his family history on another drama no less dangerous to those who took part in it and found that his whole soul was moved by this record of what had happened forty years ago. Borushka! cried Tatiana Markovna in horror when he entered her room what has come to you my friend you have been drinking she looked keenly at him for a long minute then turned away when she read in his tell-tale face that he too had heard the talk about her past self 
End of chapter 35